Good morning. morning. I'd like to welcome all that are here to join us together in fellowship this morning. It's Sunday morning, the 17th of January. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, back page of your uh, bulletin. We have the calendar. We had Sunday school at 7.30. I would encourage uh, those of you to uh, participate. Uh, we've been, uh, the adults have been doing a series on In Christ. Uh, and uh, I've enjoyed the dialogue that we've been having as we study the scriptures. Uh, Tuesday, Holy Yoga at 5.30. I know uh, there are uh, several women that are coming in and enjoying that. If you need a little exercise or a little stretching in your life, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in a spiritual atmosphere, I believe that's uh, very, uh, uh, I think the ladies are having a very good time with that. Wednesday, the 20th, is uh, Bible study at 6 o'clock. And are you still in Romans, Pastor? No, we are actually in Acts. In Acts, okay. Acting Romans are corny. Is that how you remember the, oh, that's how I remember the scripture, or the books of the Bible. And then uh, just be sure to have on your calendar that after service on January 31st is our annual meeting. Uh, if you're interested in serving on a board next year, please contact Andy, Laura, Vicki, or Don. Uh, Don, is there a list of what positions are open or are uh, that are needed somewhere? Good. You're in good shape? Okay, great. Uh, we appreciate all of the... Uh, members of the church that have stepped up uh, in those in helping in those positions. Uh, offerings can be mailed to um, Patty Kissler. Her address is there, uh, and uh, we always uh, would ask that you check the sign-up sheet. Um, there's always a need for lay leaders, greeters uh, uh, for the church. Let's turn back to our Inside Over Bulletin. And our call for worship is from the uh, Psalm 10. Lord, sometimes it seems as if you stay far away. People with trouble can't see you. Help us to look past our troubles and through to your hand at work. Bent people do crooked things, but don't even notice God's laws and wise teaching lord we want you to get up and do something through us help us change our world let's join together uh, and sing hymn number 74 oh for a thousand tongues to sing mary let me make sure i'm in tune with you go ahead and play g chord oh that's a miracle okay we'll be <laughs> Our scripture this morning from the Old Testament comes from the book of Exodus and the New Testament from the book of Luke. And in um, Exodus, we'll be reading verses 32, 7 through 14. And you'll find that in your pew Bible on page 138. So we'll start with Exodus chapter 32, beginning with verse 7 through verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. 
they have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought favor of the Lord, his God. O Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, with a great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented, and, not, and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And our second reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, and you'll find that on 1623 in your pew Bible. Luke 15, verses 1 through 10, and uh, this is entitled, The Parable of the Lost Sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. And the parable of the lost coin, verse 8. Oh, suppose the, fa the woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to uh, introduce my wife, who's going to be sharing some special music with, uh, with Mary this morning. Thank you. on page 435 in case you would like to look at it and even sing along with me. A pilgrim was I and a wandering in the cold night of sin I did roam when Jesus the kind shepherd found Day. 
when I walk through the dark, lonesome valley. My Savior will walk with me there, and safely His great hand will lead me to the mansions He's gone to prepare. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the day. This is just a reminder that during the congregation's like chill with joys and uh, concerns, joys we'll be turning the sanctuary days. microphone off to protect the privacy of those in the meeting house. As always, if you have something about which you'd like to have others join you in prayer, you could contact Pastor Ed or pretty much anyone connected with the church, and we'll put you on the prayer chain and lift your concerns to the Lord. In the meantime, please join us in an attitude prayer, and we'll have a few moments of silence before we turn the sound back up and join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. God of abiding love, present in all our beginnings, acquainted with all our ways, and intricately woven into the depths of all things, you understand our thoughts from far off, and you know our ways intimately. As we gather to worship you, nothing is hidden from you. May we recognize your voice in our midst. As we gather to give you thanks and praise, may we relish all of the days you have written for us. And 
as we sing and pray and tell our stories. Grant that when we come to the end of ourselves, we would find you. Every week we pray the Lord's Prayer and use the phrase, forgive us our sins as we forgive. Specifically, Lord, forgive us for when we cause division without acting in compassion or care. Forgive us for when we choose to ignore the way of love. Forgive us for the hurts we cause one another. May we be forgiven in the same measure that we forgive. Thank you that you are with us in the highs and lows of life when we're busy and when we're still, when we believe with all our hearts and when we're barely hanging on by our fingertips to our faith. And we say thank you for the gift of your love given to us in Christ Jesus, our shepherd, healer, example, and teacher. Reconciling God, we pray for your world. May all that's divided by doctrine or politics, class or nationality, be united in your praise. Pray for a peaceful world where children grow up without fear, where security rests on trust rather than threats, and where nations fight against poverty rather than against each other. We pray especially for those who are in authority right now, for those that lead us. May they establish right priorities, and by that your wisdom and their vision, the world may reflect your kingdom. Healing God, we pray for those who are ill and suffering, for all who are worried, for those who are grieving or, ex or experiencing trauma, and for a world gripped by the repercussions of pandemic. You know our greatest fears, our longings, and our hopes. And sometimes these are expressed in lots of different ways. So Lord, in your mercy, hear those prayers. Eternal God, present among us, you are with us in our gathering. You are with us in our distancing. Hear our prayers and blend our voices together. Unite us by your Spirit as we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray in the language of our heart, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. And now let's sing together, Open My Eyes That I May See, number 354. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the one
And now let's ask the Holy Spirit to come and open our eyes and our ears, our mouths, and our mind that we would be able to be more like Jesus. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we are gathered together as your people. And it's not just that we're gathered because of a a shared interest or affinity. It's not just that we're gathered because many of us are related to one another. It's bigger than that. It's deeper and wider than that. We gather together because you draw us. We are the called out ones. You have called us out of the world and drawn us together to be your people. So Lord, if there is anything in us that we're trying to fool ourselves or hold on to that's tripping us up. Frankly, the Holy Spirit causes us to fall flat on our face and make us uh, unable to ignore that anymore and just drag that thing to the foot of the cross and leave it. Shape us. Shape us to, to not only be like Jesus, but to follow his example. To spend time in listening for what the Father is telling us to do. How you are leading and guiding and prompting. If there's anything human in this time, we pray, Lord, that that would be forgotten. And only that which is from you would remain. Deepen us, Lord. We read this morning in our adult Sunday school that your riches are un- Searchable. They are beyond our ability to find the bottom of. So deepen us. Help us to go farther up and deeper in your grace. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You know, back in the uh, middle of the 20th century, uh, the Germans had a rocket program, and um, the developer of the V-2 rocket, his name was Dr. Von Braun, pretty famous German rocket scientist. And he once said, and I wrote this quote down because I thought it was great, as science yields more knowledge about the creation, it makes us able to live without faith in a creator. Yet, so far... With every new answer, we've discovered new questions. The better we understand, the more reason we have found to marvel at the wonder of God's creation. It is definitely possible for someone to walk through this life and look at all of the wonders that are around us and miss God at work. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant tells us that there are three questions which mankind has always been asking. What can I know? What shall I do? And for what may I hope? I am a big fan of great questions. Sure, it's my stated goal that eventually I'm going to know everything. I want to learn everything possible there is to learn. But you can't do that without asking questions. I I don't know what it is in me. Maybe that was something that was instilled in me when I was a little kid. But, But to look around and go, 
hmm, I wonder why that is the way it is, is for me a very valuable way to look at the world, to ask lots of questions. So when I read scripture, I come across questions, things in the text that make me go, hmm, I wonder why Jesus or whoever is speaking said that. I wonder what he's getting at. And frankly, one of the neat things about scripture is that it's the living word of God among us. So it doesn't matter how many times I end up reading this. I don't know. Have you had this experience where you keep reading it and you find something new? All the, Anybody else? You, you just find something new in the text all the time. And, and frankly, and this isn't to like beat anybody up, but, but let's just say there are a number of younger people here today. If you read the Bible and you're thinking, well, this is kind of dull or this is kind of boring or whatever, I, I'm just going to guess that you might not actually be paying attention to it. There's amazing stuff in here. And I don't mean spiritually deep amazing, although that's there too. There's just great stories in here, really interesting stuff to read. And if you haven't come across that stuff, I'm just going to, young people, I'm going to point you to a really gory book in the Bible, the book of Judges. It's full of awful, terrible stories that have amazing endings. It's so good. It's like the Marvel extended universe of scripture. In fact, the, the judges have often been referred to as Israel's heroes. And it's kind of interesting because the whole nation of Israel in the book of Judges is in this downward spiral. And they keep having heroes show up and try to rescue them. And everybody's like, yeah, that was great. And then they do something worse. <laughs> and it just gets awful and terrible and awful and terrible. And whew, Great stories in there to read. And you find, at least I do, find something new all the time. So when I look at the, the words of Jesus, when I read his parables, and, I'm, and I try to picture in my mind that he's having this conversation with people and telling them a story what questions come to mind? The point of the parable, I think, rests in its questions that it raises. And there's three questions that I want us to look at today when we look at the parable that we're going to look at in Luke chapter 15. So turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. In the Pew Bible, it's on a page that I don't have listed here. Once again, 1138? 1138. Oh, Luke 1523. Okay. 1623. Now, if you don't have, if you don't uh, want to use the pew Bible, bring your own with you. Open it up. Get used to where that stuff is. Luke chapter 15 is where we're going to be. We're going to look at 10 verses today, and I th think we're going to see three questions that I, I think are good for us to grapple with. The point of the parable rests in these questions. So let's read verses 1 through 3, this first section. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Okay, we're going to stop right there before we even get into the parable. I want us to ask, to, to see this question, what is a welcome worth? What's a welcome worth? Now, notice in verse 1, Jesus attracts sinners. Now, is in your Bible, is the word sinners in quotes? Yeah? Now, it says like the tax collectors and sinners. Are the tax collectors sinners? Everybody's a sinner, right? So, okay, so the whole, re the, the editor puts quotes around sinners to make sure that we understand that they are two separate groups of people that we're dealing with. It's not that the tax collectors aren't sinners, but for the sake of this parable of this setup, we need to understand that the tax collectors don't think that they are sinners. They think the other guy is the bad guy. We're amazing. We're wonderful. We collect taxes. I think that's a misnomer right there, but the tax collectors think that they're on the side of good. <laughs> I'm just enough of a libertarian to go, that's just not right at all. But the editor wants us to make sure that there's two groups of people. And look at what's going on here. Jesus is attracting sinners. And he's not the reason why people reject him. I think there's more to it than just Jesus himself. 
verse 2 shows us that the religious people are muttering about others. And that is a problem. Have you ever run across somebody who's just obviously not of your mental persuasion about whatever it is? It doesn't have to be a religion, religion, politics, trying to decide what restaurant you're going to go to, whatever. I don't care. But if whenever you run up against the, the other, somebody who has a different viewpoint than you, let's be honest now, do you kind of mutter a little bit? When I was a kid, there was a cartoon I don't even remember the name of the cartoon, but it had this little dog on it, and this dog would just kind of... And I don't know why that planted itself deep in me. When I get really frustrated, I will actually say the words, Ragus, fragum, mega, ragus, fragum. I'm muttering like that cartoon dog did because I'm frustrated with something. That's what these religious people were doing about the other group the quote-unquote sinners. They're sinners too, but they want to mutter about the other guy. And Jesus sees this as a problem. He notices this, this tendency to mutter about the other, and he addresses it. So what's, what's a welcome worth? Is it, is it worth considering? It's so much worth considering that Jesus specifically tells a parable about it. So now let's look at the first parable. He's got two of them, two short ones right in a row. So let's look at verses 4 through 7, the first one. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So here's another question to think about. Why search for the stray? Why search for the stray? You know, 99 is a pretty good number of sheep. Why not just be happy? Why go after the lost sheep? Look at verses 5 and 6. I think the answer is here. When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found the lost sheep. Does he say the? No. It's my lost sheep. The lost belong to Jesus. What's the old phrase from the spiritual? All God's children are all God's children. And we've talked about this before. The Greek word for all means all. (laughs) It's not a tough one. Everybody Jesus loves and cares for. And it says that when he puts the sheep on his shoulders, where does he go? What's it say? He goes home. He goes home. The lost sheep belong home. That's huge. Have you ever seen the picture of um, the lost sheep who stayed lost for five years? You know, you, you, when I think of a picture of a sheep, I think of a oh, cute little fluffy thing. This thing wasn't cute fluffy. It was so fluffy, it looked at, like it had been uh, like a cartoon, pumped full of air. It was just this, the, the wool was so big and so thick and so matted because it had been on its own in the wild for five years. It, it looked like a rock. It didn't look like a sheep anymore. I, I keep thinking, how would the shepherd have picked that thing up and put it on its shoulders? These days, might have been the, the shepherd finds the lost sheep and puts him in his little quad four-by-four thing because this baby had gotten to be pretty chunky by that time. Because this particular sheep had been away from care for so long and it couldn't care for itself. Oh, it probably found food to eat. 
but it wasn't cared for. And it was immediately obvious that it hadn't been cared for just by looking at it. The lost matter. They belong to Jesus and they belong home. Verse 7 reminds us that sinners are supposed to come home. That's where we belong. Sinners are supposed to come home. Now, granted, right now, we're all you know doing the whole socially distant thing and every other pew is roped off. And, and I understand the necessity of that from the aspect of health and all of that stuff. As a, as a pastor in a church, it drives me crazy because I think in my brain that this place should be standing room only every single Sunday. Now, this is not a guilt thing, and this isn't me trying to, you know, go out and compel people to come in or whatever, but lost people don't realize how much they need Jesus. They think they're doing fine, but they're not. They need to come home. So why search for the stray? So the next question is in the next parable. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. New parable. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What's the lost cost? What's the lost cost? Now, this isn't just what do the lost cost. The answer of that is fairly simple. The life of Jesus on the cross. That's what God paid for the lost. But what cost are the lost paying in and of themselves? Do, do they figure this out? Verse 8, you know, I kind of look at this. Jesus tells his first parable, and he tells it to people who live in the country. And then just to make sure the city folk don't lose out, it's like, well, you country people may not be able to get to this whole sheep thing, so let's deal with cash. It's all about what you value. So let's talk about value for a minute, Jesus says. Why would she care? Verse 9, what does she do when she finds her coin? Come on, tell me out loud, what's she do? She goes and she talks to all of her friends. Hey, I found my coin. Why? Why would she care if her friends and neighbors rejoiced with her? Think about this one. Now, this is kind of um, dependent upon an understanding of neighborhood and hospitality that we don't really practice anymore. Neighbors were really interdependent upon one another back in the day. So, consider that the woman now, now that she has found this coin that she had lost, she has the means to bless her friends and neighbors with the value of that lost coin. That lost coin might go to pay for staples like flour and oil so that she can make bread so that she's got bread on hand so that if the neighbor across the way finds themselves short you know they can't just run down to T and C they don't have the local T and C for them the local grocery store for those of you who might be watching online so your neighbor's pantry might be the thing that keeps you from starving we see this in other parables as well someone in the middle of the night has someone show up and they've got nothing to give them so they go next door and they start pounding on the door hey i had somebody show up and i need bread to give them give me bread and the response is i'm in bed asleep well you're not asleep anymore are you now that you're awake get up and give me bread and jesus says if you need bread, you keep pounding on the door until you annoy your neighbor into giving you bread so that they can get back to sleep. And then you can finally act out the act of hospitality. You, just by pounding, asking, seeking, knocking, you have brought your neighbor in on the act of hospitality. Their ability to care for their household extends to you. Your ability to care for your household extends to your neighbor. That's how interconnected 
this society was. Are we like that now? Maybe not so much. Been a long time since I've had somebody say, um, you know, I need a cup of flour. Can, can you? But I remember growing up, we would have those conversations. Somebody would, would borrow a cup of flour, our next door neighbors, the Drosts. I don't know if you guys are watching, but hi, Dros. Hey, I'm a little short. And they, they would send over their kid, Laura, and would borrow a cup of flour. And you know, if we were short, I don't know, salt or whatever, we could go next door to the Drosts or the Cravens or whoever was around, and we'd it just saved a trip to the store. There's something special about that. And this woman who finds this coin, rejoice with me. I have found this coin. This might be something that's a benefit to all of us. Now, maybe not. Maybe those neighbors who rejoice with her are never going to ask her, well, now that I know you have 10 coins instead of nine, could you loan me one? But she doesn't keep that information secret. I think that's pretty important. Look at verse 10. There's something I want us to make sure that we catch. The opening phrase that Jesus says, in the same way. I tell you there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In the same way as the lost sheep who was returned. God values the lost God values the lost so much so that he sends his son to die, to be tortured to death, to buy them back from the devil. Now, that's an old style of theology. It's called ransom theology that we don't really talk about much anymore. It's kind of gone out of favor. But the idea is that whether we like to believe it or not, we are all slaves to sin. And if left to our own devices, we are stuck serving Satan. We're stuck in the devil's camp and there's no way for us to buy our own freedom. We cannot get free because all of the wages that we generate just lead to death. The wages of sin is death. But, love that, Romans 6, 23, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus paid for the lost, all of the lost, you, me, those who don't yet know Jesus, but maybe are going to turn to him. Here's the thing. The cross is functionally the doorway. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus, right? Oh, come on, right? Thank you. All right. I can't see many of your faces because they're all covered by masks. So I just need you to nod, you know, give me a little bit of response. So John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. So we preach the gospel. We share the truth about Jesus with everybody we can in whatever way we can. You may not be the pulpit pounding evangelist. You might just be able to, I don't know, share God's love with somebody in some practical way. And in seeing that, they, that might be the, the tipping point that they go, oh, oh, now I get it. We don't know who is going to accept Jesus and who is not. Only God knows that. We don't know ourselves the moment before we accept that we're going to do that. Now, I believe uh, that Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit is actually kind of inserted into us before we recognize His presence, and He enables us to respond to the Holy Spirit, or He enables us to respond to the Gospel. The Holy Spirit does. But we don't know. And so we share the Gospel with anybody and everybody. I figure, you know, just preach to everybody and let God sort them out. We don't know. They don't know, but God does. God values the lost. Where do the lost belong? Here. Home. 
Have you heard the old hymn? Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Why does a shepherd raise his sheep? Because of what they provide for the shepherd. That's why they're valued. Sheep <laughs> are intended for consumption. Why does a person look for a lost paycheck? You ever lost a paycheck? I know I have. And you turn over the whole house until you find it. For the same reason, because of high value. These parables show us that God values the lost, even when we're unable to see the value, the guys who were muttering, are a bunch of sinners. But we are infinitely valued because of what he did to find and redeem us. And everyone's value is the same under God. Think about this one. If the lost knew how much we valued them because God values them, wouldn't they want to come home? Wouldn't this place be standing room only all the time? I've got to think that the only reason that they don't come here is that they don't know how much we value them. And our value of them is frankly pales in comparison to God's. Who do you value? And who do you discount? And why? Let's pray. Lord God, it is challenging to many of us to consider this idea that you expect us to go search for the lost. Well, that's a pastor's job. He's an evangelist. He'll do it. That's not wrong. It is my job. And I do try. But I also recognize the job is way bigger than me. And for some inexplicable reason to me, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has not called and tapped me to be his replacement. So I get to preach here. And I get to remind us as a, as a player coach, as just another member of the congregation, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. This is great news we have to share. So let's share. Not a sermon about guilt. Not me trying to put the thumb screws to anybody. But simply a recognition that this job is bigger than any one of us. It will take all of us to share in whatever way we can, based out of whoever we are. And it's more than this particular congregation can accomplish. So we pray for our other churches in town. We pray for the Baptist church. And we pray for the Assembly of God. And we pray for the Catholic Church. And we pray for uh, Novo Pacto, the people who are meeting over in the old Mennonite building. And we, we pray for the Mission Church, whose church name I can never remember because it's long and it's in Spanish. But on First Street. We pray that people would come to saving knowledge of you by seeing you at work in those you have redeemed. Help us to understand how much the lost mean to you and to invite them to come home. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the hymn I'd like us to sing in response is uh, 463. I'm, I'm sure Jamie has heard this before, but I want to make sure that you guys all publicly hear this. If for some reason any of you outlive me, I want this sung at my funeral.
Believe me, I will be singing along with it with you in heaven. Let's stand together and sing I Love to Tell the Story. Before we take a moment to sing the doxology, I'd just like to remind you all that the offering plate is in the back. Please give generously to the work of this church and the ministries that we support. And those of you who are at home, uh, please give generously to the ministries that are helping you at this time. So let's sing the doxology together, shall we? Praise God from me. Blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above the heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. And now we're going to sing a song that I learned, uh, actually, I learned this song one week before I became a follower of Jesus, at the camp where I really understood the gospel for the first time. It's called Pass It On. So let me grab my guitar and we'll sing together.
I'll shout it from the mountaintop. I'll shout it from the mountaintop. I want my world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. Lord God, we do want to pass on the the value of people, to people, to let the lost know that, come home, we want you here. It's not the same without you, home. You're so important that you're worth going after. Jesus did. We want to, too. Prompt us, Lord, to move and show us who we should talk to. Be clear and specific so we can't miss it, so that they don't. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed, everyone.